If God were to say to you, you can have anything you want, I'll give you one wish, what would you ask for? Some of you are going, uh, win the lottery? How many of you are going, I would like to have a body that is thinner than the one I'm in now? Some of you would be going, oh man, anything I want, I want a husband. Some of you in here may be going... I'd like a different husband. <laughs> Don't in raise your hand on that one, please. One guy in the Bible got that opportunity. His name was Solomon. Solomon's father was King David. He was the third king of Israel. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, God said, Solomon, I've been watching your life. You can have any one thing. What do you want? Fame, power, possessions? pleasure? What do you want? Solomon said, I want wisdom. And God was so pleased. God said, not, am I, not only am I going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you everything else that you didn't ask for. And Solomon became the wisest man who ever lived. And Solomon then went on to write a book. And that book has the name, the book of Proverbs. And why this is such a big deal is this. By the way, our country is into massive amounts of knowledge and low levels of wisdom, which is why people are sophisticated, not mature. And if you go after this subject full force, here's what you realize. God can give you wealth. How many of you would like that to happen? I'm with I would. The, God can give you wealth. But if you don't have wisdom to manage it, you'll lose that wealth. God can give you friends. He can surround you with a lot of really great people, but if you don't have wisdom to relate to those friends wisely, you're going to lose all those friends. God can give you a family. What an incredible, great gift that is. But if you don't connect with them and live with that family in ways that are wise, you can actually wreck that family and ruin a lot of futures. God can give you a long life. How many of you would like the gift of a long life? Actually, look around. Somebody already got it. Okay, congratulations. Okay. <laughs> God can give you a long life. That is a great gift to have. The problem is this. We all know people who've lived a long, miserable life. In other words, wisdom, Proverbs would say, with wisdom, you have everything, and without wisdom, you have nothing, and you're going to lose everything you've got, which is why we're going to go after this book full force. Now, if you turn to the second page, okay, the Proverbs is principles for wise living, smart living. The goal of Proverbs is in the first verse. Here it is, okay? The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, and here it is, three words, to know what? Circle that, to know wisdom. We're going to give you an overview of what this book is. Then we're going to go after this full force for 31 days. Proverbs wants to speak to four different audiences. It wants to say, in these four groups, you've got to know wisdom or there's destruction and disaster in your future. And here, I want you to do this. As we go through these four, mark which one of these apply to you. Some of you, you're going to mark all four of them. Some of you, you're going to say, man, that is me. That's where I need to be listening as we teach through Proverbs. Here's the first one. The goal of Proverbs is to inspire the young. What Proverbs says is, hey, before you mess it up, let me speak into your life. And here's the thing. When we apply Proverbs, Proverbs applied, it leads to a life well led. If you want to make the most of your life, be a person who knows the book of Proverbs. It says here in Proverbs 3, 1 through 4, my son, do not forget my teaching. Why? It will give you a good name and you'll find favor with others. What do you need as a young person to move ahead in life? You need favor with others. And Proverbs speaks directly to that. Now, the second one is this. It's to instruct the lazy and the foolish. Now, how many here would say, I'm lazy and foolish? Any lazy? You know, 
How many have worked with a lazy, foolish person before, though? We can recognize laziness in someone else, but we don't really see it in our own life, do we? In fact, scientists have actually quantified this. You know how much sleep the average person needs? Just 15 minutes more. I just need 15 <laughs> minutes more, Lord. Let me hit that snooze one more time. You see, when we're in the midst of a season where we really need to buck up and go after it, sometimes we have a hard time seeing it. The Bible instructs those of us that are doing foolish things and lazy things, and it shows us when we've got to pour gas on. Here's what it says. Proverbs ignored leads to dishonor and destruction. Proverbs 6, 10, and 11. A little sleep. A little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and you have an eight-year recession. <laughs> Is it time for you to kind of take it to the next level? Proverbs will help you figure that out. Here's the third one, to insulate the faithful. Proverbs applied guards us against the evil acts of others. You know, there is no absolute protection against all the brokenness in our world. But when you walk in wisdom, when you actually apply over and over again the wisdom of God, it insulates you from the harm that can come in our world. Look at the proverb in 22.3. A prudent man sees danger and takes refuge, but, a simple, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. How open are your eyes? Where are you taking refuge? Proverbs will help you figure that out. And the last one, this is a principle we've seen over and over again. You know this principle already. It's simply this. Proverbs speaks to the wise to increase the wise. Proverbs applied helps the wise get wiser and wiser and wiser. People with good marriages get great marriages. People with great marriages get even better marriages. Your finances are healthy. Your wealth is built. Your relationships are good. They get even better. In every area, the strong get stronger when they have the humility to apply the wisdom of Proverbs. Notice the verse right below there. Wise people have what? Great power. And that's power to do the four most important things in life that Proverbs talks about. Power to, here's the first one, write it in, change. How many here have ever failed on a diet? Change is not easy. Proverbs actually gives you the power to make real transformation happen. And the second one is power to lead. The truth of the matter, all of us have leadership situations at work, in our home, with teenagers. Like John said earlier, we need to be able to be leaders. And here's the last one, or the last two, the power to decide. How many here have ever been in a situation where you had so many choices you just froze? Proverbs helps you discern which one of those choices to make. And the very last one is this, the power to live. So many people just, they do dumb things and they don't actually get the opportunity to live the way God wants them to live. You can live better. In fact, just to make this personal, if I had to kind of summarize what I think God intends for the entire book of Proverbs, it would be this question. How many here have ever had a great teacher? Yeah, I mean, just a standout teacher somewhere in your past. We've all had that moment where some teacher spoke something into our life, and it changed us forever. I, I, I did in fifth grade. Her name was Mrs. Walters. Mrs. Walters was awesome. She was smart. She was on task. She was very nice. She had rules you absolutely had to follow. And she actually taught during an era, and I don't know if you, any of you remember this, when it was legal to beat children in public school. Does anyone? <laughs> how many here got a SWAT at some time in their life? Wow. Hey, wait, what was this? How many actually got a SWAT in school at some point? <laughs> we seem to attract these how people. How many of you deserve church. that SWAT? <laughs> how many should have got more SWATs? Anyone? <laughs> I actually have a kind of a distinction in this area. In OMAC Elementary School, I hold the all-time record for fifth graders in the amount of swats given to a child. For, for a long part of the year, Nick Hainer was ahead of me. He had 16 swats. But in one day, I passed him up with 21 swats. Because in one day, one day alone, I got nine of those swats in one day. You see, it, it happened to, it really wasn't my fault, honestly. Why did they laugh at that? I, I got this bad test on a grade, a, a bad grade on a test, I mean, and I got frustrated, and, and the, I threw the test, and I hit this kid right in the head. His name was Gary August Smith. Now, parents, side note, be careful what the initials of your children end up spelling. <laughs> in fifth grade, having the initials that spell gas is not a good thing. And, uh, but I, I hit Gary, and the teacher saw it, and she's like, there's no throwing in class. You get three swats. And she marks it down in her little book for after school that day. And then I, I actually, there's a thing in her class, Mrs. Walter's class, called no talk time. You weren't allowed to talk at all. And you might find this shocking. That was hard for me. And I actually 
got a mark for no talk time. So that's three swats if you talk during no talk time. And then I got made fun of for that at recess by Kenny Bidlin. So I had to get in a fight with Kenny Bidlin, and then there's no fighting. So all of a sudden, it's a Friday afternoon, and I have nine swats in the book. And so school gets over. I go up right to Mrs. Walters. Let's get this over with. Uh, I'm ready for your swats. And she said, Kurt, I have a meeting. We're going to have to do your swats on Monday morning. <laughs> Worst weekend of my life. And I'm telling you, the, you know, when you do dumb things, you can see the destruction coming at you like a locomotive. And the worst part is waiting for it to get there. I showed up to school at 5 a.m. on Monday morning. I'm just waiting outside the principal's office. She finally shows up. She's in high heels. She actually did this for psychological effect. She takes the high heels off, and she had a pair of tennis shoes in the principal's office. She changed into. And, and you know, I'm just sitting there quaking. And right before she gives me the hack, she looks right at me, and she says, Kurt Harlow, you're not a dumb kid. Quit doing dumb things. You're going to ruin your life. You're a smart kid. You could do better than this. And I just want to be honest with you. This is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. You know they always say that? It's going to hurt me. No, she said, you're going to destroy your life. You're a smart kid. And if I had to put Proverbs into one phrase, it's this. It's God's great teacher to look at every one of you, no matter where you're at, and me included, and say, stop doing dumb things. You can do better with your life if you'll apply this wisdom. Isn't that great? Proverbs over and over says, you're not a dumb person. Stop doing dumb things. Let me give you a definition of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. There's wisdom in the Bible is the ability to make great decisions. Wisdom in the Bible is the ability to make great decisions. Now, that actually leads to a great life. So, for example, let me put a chart up here, okay? Proverbs, and it, you're, you're going to have a ball reading this book. For 31 days, we're going to read the 31 chapters, okay? Now, what happens is Proverbs, as it lays out, Almost every verse in Proverbs goes, if you're wise, you'll do this, but idiots do this, okay? And you'll, you'll, you'll see there's a duality in the book of Proverbs, okay? Because Proverbs says this, there's fundamentally two kinds of people. There are people that are wise, wise and people that are foolish. foolish, and wise people make decisions that lead to life, and foolish people make decisions that lead to death. And it keeps driving everything that direction. Now... We're going to begin, well, let me ask a question. Has anybody here ever made a stupid decision? Well, don't, don't put your hands up yet. <laughs> Some people are so That's willing. a good idea, though. <laughs> well, let's do a mass confession this morning. What I'd like you to do is this. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever made a foolish decision of any kind. Wait till Financially, really, well, yeah, hold on. Don't get ahead of me here, okay? For example, if you have ever messed up when it comes to your physical health. If you, not yet, not yet. If you ever messed up when it comes to your spiritual health, if you have ever said something stupid or dumb and wished you hadn't said it, if you've ever said something that hurt people, if you have ever made a foolish relational choice, or if you have ever made, and you're sitting next to him, no. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> Mammy, you're laughing about yourself if, or if your neighbor? If you have ever there, made a really dumb romantic decision, if you have ever been less than insightful about your time management or about your goal setting, or if you've ever made dumb parenting choices, or if you've ever made dumb choices about TV viewing or internet watching, if you've ever made a bad decision with the benefit of hindsight that could be characterized by the word dumb, would you raise your hand right now? Turn to the person next to you and say, welcome to the school for fools. <laughs> that is the book of Proverbs. Now, here, ladies and gentlemen, here's the, pro here's the problem. We make our decisions, and then our decisions make us. That's good. We make our decisions, and then our decisions make us. In other words, you add up a million little decisions, and what you get is your life. That's your life. Your life is making a million decisions, and that's what you end up with is as a life. Now, the Bible has a word for people who navigate life really well and end up with a great life, and that word is wise, okay? And John Ortberg actually said this recently. This is brilliant. He said, I look at people in our church who go down the wrong path, sometimes 
really, really bright people. But every week I hear about people in our church mm -hmm. who in their relationships or how they've dealt with anger or how they've dealt with money or what they've done with their kids or how they've handled their teenagers or what they've done with their marriage or how they've neglected their families. They just drift into absolute disaster even though they're Christians. And he says, I want to say to every single one of us, wisdom would cry out, don't go down that path. Don't make choices in your everyday life that leave God's wisdom out of the equations. There, there is infinitely more at stake in the everyday decisions of life than he's really, than you can imagine. Make up your mind, you will follow wisdom. And so what we're going to do is this. We are going to take the book of Proverbs, 31 chapters, God pouring out wisdom. Best thing you could ever do would be to take the wisdom of Proverbs, put it in the middle of your life, and then let it invade every area of my life about how I make decisions. Now, Proverbs has eight areas. There are eight areas in the book of Proverbs that Proverbs says you cannot afford to consistently make dumb decisions in these eight areas because it will wreck your life and take you down. Now, we're going to spend three weeks and we are going to walk you through a ton of verses in this great book and we're going to take a look at all eight of these areas and what Proverbs has to say about the eight key areas of life. I want to give you a quick warning and here's the warning. If it's not like your life's going to end up badly if you mess up in all eight areas. All I have to do is make major league bad decisions in one of the eight areas, and it can destroy the entire house. If you don't believe that, I have two words for you. Lance Armstrong. Tragic what's happened, because I like that guy. Tragic. Two more words. Tiger Woods, who, my favorite golfer of all time. And you take a look at this, and you go, just bad non-wisdom decisions in one area can crumble the entire thing. So we're going to take a look at all eight areas in some pretty deep ways. So if you would flip that outline to the next page, we're going to get at it. We're going to start this week, and here we go. The first one is kind of a light topic. Um, <laughs> actually, it's a pretty heavy deal, and we thought, who would be appropriate to speak on this subject because it's kind of touchy, so we gave it to Kurt. So here's the thing. Before I tell you to fill in the blank, I want you to write a 1 and a 10 on the top of your notes. Just a 1 and a 10. And I want you to grade. And I want you to do this before I tell you the topic. Write really small because you may not want your neighbor to see the grade you give yourself. Here's the first area that's mentioned in Proverbs. And it's all throughout the thing. It's wise sexuality. The truth of the matter is Proverbs is a book about sex. It's in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 4, all of 5, all of 6, all of 7. It gets mentioned in 12, 13, 18 features it again. It comes back in 23. In fact, a third of this book has to do with marriage, sex, and relationships with the opposite gender. This book, I mean, it's so sexual, I'm surprised it's not banned in most Christian schools. And because this book does it, and it talks about it honestly. If you're going to grade yourself on the area of how you handled your life in the area of sexuality, what grade would you give yourself? And here's the thing. I want to give you some good news about the advice of Proverbs on sex. Don't be afraid of it because it's not all just don't do this and don't do that and stop doing this. In fact, it deals with sex so honestly, the emphasis is about what you should do. Look here. It's not just about don't. Look at the verse, Proverbs 5, 18. Let your fountain be blessed. And rejoice, circle that word rejoice, in the wife of your youth. In other words, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, hey, just don't get divorced. Hang in there and don't get divorced. No, it says the wise person works to make sure that their marriage relationship is filled with joy. The best way to overcome bad relationship is healthy, awesome, incredibly joyful relationship. In fact, the Bible exhorts us to let the wife of your youth satisfy her with your, plug the ears of your kids, breasts. It's in the Bible. Man, getting hot in here. Sorry, it's in there in the Bible. And it says, in fact, your attitude, man, should be such this. When your wife walks in the room, her presence, Proverbs says, should intoxicate you. 
What are you doing proactively to ensure that your wife, the entire history of your life, intoxicates you? I'll give you one piece of advice. Go to the marriage retreat. Just signing up for anything in Napa, you're already being a wise person right there. (laughs) And here's the thing. I want to talk to single people for a moment because this is so cool and it's so wise. And if you've been married more than six months, you're going to figure this one out. It's about looking beyond the surface. If you make getting together with someone all about the surface, and I I see this in young people all the time. I ask them, what are you looking for in a mate? And the first four things they say are all physical. It's all about the outward appearance. I've got this rule. Marry someone that can give you children that can do math. It's, you know, I mean, (laughs) if they can do their own math homework, you're going to be way ahead. That's a wise thing. All the married people are laughing because they know how true this is. Listen, I don't care how she looks in her jeans. J-E-A-N-S. I care about her genes, G-E-N-E-S. It's the inside that counts. And Proverbs is filled with advice that says, don't be fooled by the cute one. Go after the, not, not the beautiful one. Go after the one that prays and works hard and solves problems and most of all, respects God with their whole heart, that fears God in a way that says, I'm going to walk with you in wisdom our entire lives. That's right. First area is wise sexuality, and that is all through the book of Proverbs, okay, cover to cover. Um, Second area, and I'm going to blow by this one because we're going to come back to it next week, and here it is, wise responses, wise responses. Proverbs talks a lot about if you lose your temper, you're going to bring destruction, and if you keep your cool, you're going to have a very, very different kind of life. And we, how many of you know who Renee Schlepfer is? Great Bible teacher, great communicator. He'll be here next week and tackle this subject. I just want to make one quick comment. Notice the second verse there. A hot-tempered man gets into all kinds of what? Trouble. Trouble. Notice the next one. The fool provokes his family to anger and resentment and will finally have nothing worth following. Some people, the way they act with life produces anger and resentment. I want to make a quick comment here and then we're going to move on. There are some churches and ministries and radio programs out there, that the way they are teaching the Bible, they are producing angry Christians. Mm. Have you met any of these people? And they're angry, and in my opinion, the last thing America needs are a few million more angry Christians. That's right. The number one thing America needs, in my opinion, is Christians who are God-honoring Christ following authentically loving God and loving people and bringing the love of Christ to our entire community and living like Jesus who said, neither do I condemn you. Now, go and sin no more. God's got better days ahead for you. We need that more than we need a million more angry Christians. Would you agree? Okay, we're coming back. That's a big deal. We're coming back to this next week. Wise sexuality, wise responses. The third area is... Wise, and write this down, anyone who's ever dealt with someone who's got a problem in this area is going to know some attitudes. In fact, have you ever said something to a teenager and they rolled their eyes so hard you felt like they pulled a muscle in their brain? Anyone (laughs) see this before? The worst thing in the world is dealing with someone that has a bad attitude. Look what Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says. And this is just, this is one of the just most pithy, incredible verses in the entire scripture. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways. Circle this word, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And what's the benefit if you do that? It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. The Bible talks over and over again about the heart, and Proverbs nails it. It talks about a greedy heart and a generous heart. It talks about a hard heart and an open heart. It talks about a prideful heart and a, and a, and a humble heart. It talks about a welcoming heart and what it means to be a wise person in your heart. It's, it's like a first responder. When a first responder shows up to any accident, they might see different wounds on the body, but the first thing they want to talk about is the vital signs. If you don't protect the heart, it doesn't matter what else you heal. The whole body dies if the heart dies. And this is what God says in the book of Proverbs. Where is your heart? 
And here's the cool thing about this. That word acknowledge in that verse, that, that there's two words, are heart and acknowledge. That word acknowledge, there's actually five different choices in the Hebrew for the word acknowledge. Like one of the words they could have picked was, I acknowledge your rank. God, you have a higher rank than me, so I'm kind of acknowledging your rank. But they actually don't pick that word. Solomon here picks the word that means face to face. In other words, he's saying, bring your heart to God personally, directly. Stand before God, and and, and this whole thing can be summed up in this word. Stand before God and be teachable. Teachability is a huge deal. When we see it as pastors, nothing lights us up more than someone who says, hey, I've been successful, help me be more successful. Those are the sort of people you could just take over the world with them. A man who's got a teachable heart can do almost anything. This is... This is, would you start this one? Especially if you're a guy. This is huge. When someone is teachable, the Bible says they have what is called humility. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he can exalt you at the right time. When a husband is teachable, he'll listen to his wife. When a wife is teachable, she'll listen to a husband. When a young leader is teachable, teachability is the ceiling on your, you know, it's one right. of the reasons I love Lincoln Brewster. Lincoln's a very teachable guy. Okay? And you know what I love about him? You know, Lincoln has a phrase that you can be open to feedback or you can be close to feedback. Lincoln's going, neither one of those is good enough. We ought to be people that pursue feedback. Hmm. That's good, isn't it? Because that's the only way you ever grow and get better. And Proverbs says, wisdom is open to feedback so I grow and get better instead of hard-hearted and stuck. Um, How many of you know and appreciate Francis Chan? What you don't know about Francis Chan is uh, he is a big deal, okay? New York Times, all this kind of stuff. He's probably the number one in-demand speaker. And I don't actually like talking about this, so we may wipe this off the tape before it goes public. Francis called me a couple years ago and said, I need some help. Can you uh, coach me? Uh, I just need somebody to help me think. And I said, absolutely. And he goes, I just need somebody older than me that I can bounce ideas off of. <laughs> That'd be me, punk. The, um, and so, so we have been meeting. Matter of fact, I flew to Texas, just met with him for two days. And you know what I love about him? He is, in my opinion right now, the single most influential Christian voice in America. And he is as teachable and humble as it comes. That's cool. It's awesome. And I believe this. I believe God's got even bigger and better days of influence for him because he has stayed humble and stayed teachable. Isn't that awesome? Okay? And it's a great... How, let me just ask you. How humble and teachable are you? Are you correctable? Or are you like, no, nah, that's just the way I am. That's called the way of the fool. Get over it. Okay? Number four is this, and again, massive area, wise speech. Wise speech. There are over 120 individual verses in Proverbs <laughs> on speech because this is a huge deal. Now, let me ask you a question. Survey. Who talks more in America? Who uses more words every day, men or women? <laughs> the average. <laughs> the You're average. All very wise. Here's, here's what research shows. The average woman in America, the average man in America, 20,000 words a day. The average woman in America, 30,000 words a day. Who's married here? Who's married? That is explained, doesn't it? Okay? When the guy gets home, he's out of words, she's got 10,000 left to go. How many of you couples know exactly right. what I'm talking about? Okay. The, now, there is, <laughs> there is incredible power in words. Check out Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. He who guards his mouth controls himself. In other words, there's one path. But he who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. In other words, words can wreck things. They can ruin things. How many of you have ever, in your past, 60 people said something positive one person says one harsh, negative, critical thing. Which one do you remember? Every single time. Get out your pen because this next verse is pretty heavy. Proverbs twelve eighteen. 
thoughtless words can wound. Circle the word wound. And how serious is this? As deeply as any sword. But wisely spoken words can heal. heal. Circle the word heal. And Proverbs is actually going after something bigger than what we say. It is really saying fundamentally in life, you are going to be deeply wounded or healed. Fundamentally, you're going to be a person who wounds other people or is a healing presence in the life of other people. And I can't believe this guy's here, and neither will you when you hear his story. We wanted to do an interview as part of this message on the power of what it means to be wounded and the power of what it means to be healed and then go on to be a healing presence. And to introduce this guy, I'm going to bring John Harris out. John, John does our college ministry in Shore and a whole bunch of other stuff around here. Um, the, we, I'm going to show you a couple pictures. The first one you'll recognize, okay? Can you recognize that? Okay, that is the church in Dandora in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And that church, now, because of your generosity and a, a whole bunch of other, and a bunch of people went there to work, that has been healed and now looks like this. Which is very cool. That happened. That happened because of your generosity and it happened because this team went over there and literally killed at work, okay? There is one guy in this picture that it did not come over from Bayside. He meets us there every time. And John, tell him who that is. Yeah, so that's Peter. And a couple years ago, we took a bunch of business guys from uh, Bayside to do the church. It was great. And Peter was actually our leader. And so just kind of ride on the bus with him and talking, started hearing his story. And he is an amazing guy. So he grows up in the streets, eventually becomes a compassion kid. And we're going to be hearing a story here in just a couple minutes. But an amazing, amazing guy, and uh, we, we won't leave home without him now. He's awesome. Yeah, folks, I don't know anybody else like this on the planet. He, grew, he should be dead multiple times over. He grew up, and it's a miracle he survived that, um, uh, grew up on the streets, homeless in Africa, um, and is now one of the premier Christian leaders doing missions all over the world, and it's kind of stunning. We've talked with him. He's had to hide under dead bodies to stop from being killed. Uh, it's just amazing, this one story after a story. Whenever we go to Africa, he's the guy that goes with us and makes everything happen, okay? And so would you give Peter a hobby a Bayside welcome? We're thrilled he's here. How you doing, man? Hey, so first of all, we are glad you're here. Welcome to Bayside. Thank you very much. And um, now, first of all, give you a little picture of kind of how many countries have you been in? Uh, 95. 95 countries. Okay, I was in... In the last three weeks. <laughs> He's yeah, no kidding. Five. Seriously, yeah. Hey, where were you three days ago? Uh, I was in Uganda and Amsterdam. Uganda, and then Amsterdam, and then here. And um, what's interesting is you're making an impact all over the world. We work with you. John says, like, when we leave home. Yeah, we're not, we don't want to leave home without him, for sure. I mean, this okay. guy, a lot of people don't know this, but he's, if you think of any Christian leader, the top leaders in the world that are top Christian leaders, he's led every one of those guys. It's an amazing yeah. what he does. So. Yep, and, 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 but your life did not look like it was, it certainly didn't start this way. I know so. And, and tell these folks, what, what was life like? Where did you grow up, first of all? Well, I grew up in Uganda. My dad is from Rwanda, and my mom is from uh, Uganda, so we grew up at the border of Uganda. And, and Rwanda. it was war-torn during those times. Yes. But your home was a bigger war than the country. Yes. What was happening? Uh, well, um, as a little boy, you know, life was uh, really miserable. You know, Graf uh, was born during an Idi Amin's time. Uh, and so life was miserable in every shape form uh, as a little boy. Growing up in a village, uh, Kabale, uh, poor to, to its worst. And, and actually, I didn't have a name until when I was two years old. Uh, because for every 100 children who were born, a 50 would die before the age of two. So my mom did not name me, did not give me a name until when I was two years old. And she called me, he's a produce given to us by God. So that's what my name is. And so that was life for me. Uh, but also, we were not just poor. Uh, my family, uh, my father was the most abusive dad you could think of. 
uh, to mom and to my siblings and me as well. And being the oldest, probably first it harder than anyone else. And so that was life uh, really for me, of miserable, uh, of, of growing not knowing, is there next year? And even if there was next year, for me, I wish I didn't have to see another year for just the misery that was so, happening at home. So your dad was an alcoholic and a rageaholic. Yes. And, and you literally thought he would kill you. 100%, yes, I knew on, on how his rage towards mother and towards us. You know, I was taken to hospital several times from his abuse. So I knew any time anything could happen. So you're being beaten. And at, and at, at 11 years old... Yes. So at age of four, basically, that's when I began to realize just how life was miserable in every shape and form. And so at age of uh, 11, I hated my dad so much that I, I thought him seeing my dead body was a favor. So at age of 11, I went to the bus station and I asked the lady, I said, which bus goes the farthest? Uh, and the lady said that one. And I got on the bus, never been 10 miles away. So you didn't care where you went. Just I want to go the farthest away I can get from my dad. Yes, but also I knew if he caught me later, that was the end of it. So I wanted to go as far as I could that he would never get to see me. Never been 10 miles away, and I went 500 kilometers away, and I ended up in Kampala uh, in Uganda. Yeah, okay, so you get off in Kampala, you have no money, no anything. How do you, what did you do to survive? How come you didn't starve? Well, uh, you know, I had one option, and that one option was to be a street boy. So I figured really quickly that I can be a street kid. You know, survival basket was, you know, one, um, uh, stealing, uh, two, helping women. Most uh, women in Africa, they sell uh, food, fruits, and, and anything on the roadside. So we would help them, but most time that's how we really survived. Whatever was left over is what we used to eat as a meal. And so that became a life for me on a daily uh, basis. One, one of the things he did a lot of is push banana carts. So if you, I mean, just picking banana carts, that's why he's got such big thighs. I mean, this right. guy, he's right. like a truck, I'm telling you, man. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, now, you only would sleep a couple hours a night, is that right? And then you would sleep in shifts. Yes. As a street child, you know, a street kid, you know, you don't have a regular life like, you know, most people. The busier the day, the better for you because you move from one end to the other. And living in a city, you know, cities don't shut until, you know, sometimes three in the morning. But also, uh, most people uh, who are harsh or mean, or they would abuse us at night time. So you're always scared uh, to go to bed. So we'll sleep in shifts. So one would stay uh, on a fire while others sleep. You know, and most of the time, the best way you had was just two hours of sleep throughout 24 hours. So you're doing shifts so you don't get... And, and then, um, so you're basically going day to day. You, you grew up in a home where you have one meal every other day. And... And now you're on the streets of Kampala, and, and then you start connecting with somebody, and everything changes. Yes, absolutely. My mom had taught me one principle. She always said, if you're kind to people, they will turn the favor to you as well. And so we men were always kind, so we always helped me in that way. And so one day I helped a family, and they gave me something to eat. It was just normal as anyone uh, would do. I saw them the second time. The fourth time, I kind of knew what car they drove, what they bought, where they, where they parked, anything. So every uh, Saturday at 10 a.m., I'd be waiting for them. And so I'd you been knew on the they were coming. You're like, I got this, um, I'm, I got this spot, spot Strategy. out. Strategy. Yes. Strategy. <laughs> Good. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> and even my street friends, my other street kids, they were, they were, when they saw that family, they would always say, hey, hey, your family's here. Because they <laughs> gave me food, and I got to help them, you know, yep. share as well. And so uh, this family, so they said, hey, I'd been on the street for about four years. They said, hey, if you had an opportunity to go to school, would you go to school? And I was like, wait a minute. My dad would not want to give them me a meal. Who are you to even think you'd take me to school? So I kind of took it like, you know, kidding me, you know? Uh, but with time, they kept saying, hey, we'd like to help you. Uh, and in some way, uh, they finally came. Uh, and helped me. But before they could help me, every time I saw them, because I knew they loved school, so every time I saw them, I said, I'm going to use one language they love to hear. So every time I saw them, I said, hey, you mentioned school, would you help me? But really what I was trying to say was like, give me food, you know? <laughs> uh, you don't want to, you're just using it for food. It wasn't like I didn't want to go to school, <clears throat> but I could not imagine there's someone that kind to take me to school. And, th and then one day they shock you. Yeah, so they said, we'll take you to school on two conditions. One, you go to boarding school. When I had boarding school, it was like saying, you go to a five-star hotel. 
<laughs> and then the next one was um, that you have to attend a program at our local church. So they came and said, hey, you go take a shower. I said, uh, street children don't take showers. When it rains, that's our shower time, you know? <laughs> but I went to the sewage uh, canal in the middle of the city. It was the only way I could. And I came back smelling so bad. And they put me in the car and opened every window they had in there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but through that, they really took me to school. And it basically took me four hours to change from a street life to, in a way, a hope, a hope, a hope life. And the reason is, I'd grown from a family where no one ever said something good towards me or that I was capable of mm. being somebody. But he's a stranger, found me at my lowest street kid who stole dirty, stinky, that he could see worthiness that was worth taking to school. That's right. And so for me, that's what changed uh, my life and truly began to believe that there's a glimpse of hope for me. And, and, and who was that guy? Well, then I found out that this man was the head of Compassion International, uh, Uganda, and that's how I ended up in Compassion as a Compassion awesome. kid. And now, you, you've been on some very dangerous assignments. The most dangerous, the most scared you ever were was they sent you into... Well, I, you know, my, there was, you know, remember my dad is from Rwanda, so I speak the Rwandese language as well. So my how many my, languages do you speak? Uh, seven. Seven. Okay. You should hear his French. Uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> now you're confusing me. Now I have to think in the other languages. <laughs> I'm, I'm already thinking the other language in order to find the proper words in English, so uh, it's confusing. Uh, so uh, my sponsor said, hey, uh, uh, there's danger in your country, and you speak the language. Would you mind go and work and rescue the children? And so I drove for my first job, but when I re arrived in Rwanda, I saw dead bodies in every corner ship in, in Rwanda. We, we were talking about this. It was a massive Rwandan genocide, and, and as you, you drove down the streets, and there are nothing but bodies stacked up all the way, multiple bodies stacked on the sides of the streets. So at that point, I knew this is, my, this is the end of my life. But the question as I was standing, you know, we are kind of stuck. We didn't know where to go, and we knew people were coming to kill us. So my only thought was, I'm going to die, but where will I go? So for all I had been told in, you know, at a church, uh, now finally came to know that I will not go to heaven if I don't know Christ my Lord and Savior. And for me, what had stopped me, uh, held me from really accepting Christ my Lord and Savior is I hated my dad so much. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says, forgive even those who've longed against you. For me, that just seemed so unfair. I thought, now I'm 18, I'm going to go home and I'm going to break his leg. And then after... <laughs> <laughs> In Jesus' name. Yes. <laughs> And then after, maybe I might say, okay, now I've paid. Jesus, can you forgive me? But, but the drive, you know, I told the driver, I said, I want to go to heaven. And he said, but you work for compassion. You're a believer. I said, no, I look like one. I act like one. But I don't know him as my Lord and Savior. And I want to know him now because I want to go to heaven. And we prayed. And it was the most dangerous, but also for me, the most place that really brought me uh, close to God as well. Unbelievable. And then you got to hear the stories this guy tells. Um, and uh, I got one other quick question. Uh, the if you could look at our church, which we feel like we're such good friends, we're with you every year. That you're we're your home church now. What do y'all think? The um, um, what would you say to our church? Hey, one is you know, Bayside to me, not just as a family, but Bayside is the one of the biggest sponsors for compassion as in children. So you sponsor more than anyone we know. And so for me, I want to say thank you for what you do. Thank you for being that sponsor for me. That sponsor, there were more than 200 kids on the streets, but he didn't say, man, there's 200, what can I do? And he took one, and that one happened to be me. And I think that's the attitude you have here at Bayside. Yes, you cannot save every child, everyone in the world, but you've said for the few that we can, for the thousands and hundreds we have, we will make a difference. And so for me, I just really want to thank you for that. Then the other is, you know, I know you have packets. You receive, you have them How on your fridges. How many of you seen those packets, the pictures? Okay. You have them on the fridge, but just know it's not just a piece of paper on the fridge. Just know it's really kids looking for a glimpse of hope 
waiting for you to write and say, you matter, you're worthy as my sponsor did. So they're real. They're not just a paper. They're real. And that was me when I was little. Uh, on the trip, uh, the first trip that I was on in Africa, riding on the bus, just engaging and talking with Peter and hearing his story, and it just dawned on me, I thought, because I didn't know who he was. He was just leading all of us pastors, and I realized, you were a kid on a packet, you know? Yeah. You're actually why we're here. And I just, there's so many unbelievable leaders, and if you just give them hope, like this guy, I mean, there, there's thousands of them. So, yeah. you know, it's just not a kid on a packet, but it makes yeah. a difference. Well, we wanted to give you a couple things, okay? One is, um, <laughs> um, one is, and we're, we're, we're with you every year. Matter of fact, our next trip with you into Africa is in? November. November. Um, the, um, since we are now your official home church, we thought you should have something that, would, that you could travel with. Remember, this is a Bayside Seiko watch we've had made for you. Oh, thank okay? you very much. 95 time zones are already listed <laughs> on there. <so laughs> perfect. And, and then I have another question. Now, we need to do this quick. Um, the last time we were in, we talk about this a lot with you. Um, the, um, are you still single? <laughs> That's a yes. What, you look embarrassed. Very embarrassed, and I'm glad I'm black. Uh, otherwise, because <laughs> you're blushing, baby. The, um, I will be this blue. Is, this I'll is be the blue. we've all been watching The Bachelor, but this is actually the living Bayside Bachelor. That's right. So that's right. It's the compassionate and actual Bachelor. Uh, would you like to be married? Yesterday. All right. <laughs> Yesterday. Well, we have another thing. I did a two-part tape series called, out of the book of Proverbs on 20 questions to ask before you say, yes, I do, okay? This will be a good guide for what to look for because, hey, there's a thousands of people around here that just may be your spouse. We'll be so, doing interviews in the lobby after yeah, service. That's right. <laughs> by, <laughs> by the way, John and Peter will be in the lobby after the service. Can we take a second and say thank you to Peter? We love you. Honored to be partnering with you, man.